Um, hello from Vienna. My name is Maria Malchnik. I'm the director of the Karl Renner Institute, which is the politi political academy of the Austrian Social Democratic Party. Uh, some time ago, um, Renner Institute and FEPS teamed up together with uh, the Austrian Chamber of Labor in Vienna to start a research, pro a re research project on climate investment and climate finance. Um, we've already published the third policy paper on climate investment. Um, all, of the, all of them are written by Raphael Wildauer, Jakob Capella and Stuart Leach. And Raphael is now so kind to present the findings of the latest um, policy paper, uh, which is called um, fiscally um, which is called, uh, is a 10 trillion euros European climate investment fiscally sustainable. Raphael Wildauer is senior lecturer at the Greenwich University. Raphael, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Okay. Thanks. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for your um, interest in, in the issue of um, public investment, um, spe specifically in the context of climate, uh, the climate problems we have. Um, I will start out by giving a little bit of additional context on this uh, project Maria has um, mentioned, um, because there is, uh, this is, uh, the presentation I'm going to, to give is the, the final output. We started by really asking about fiscal sustainability of green um, investment. And um, at, the, at the very beginning, we asked ourselves, or what we thought it's, it's an Im important question to ask, to what extent is it that the Green Deal is actually able or likely to meet the Paris climate targets in, in Europe? Um, our assessment there was... Uh, probably the commission looks or is too optimistic in terms of um, what needs to be done. Um, our green investment gap, the, the one we invested, we estimated was is large, much larger than what the European Commission's assessment was. Based on that, we asked, okay, if there is um, a large substantial need for investment in green infrastructure, what is the potential of how could we um, mobilize funds? How could we close that gap? And in the second report, we looked at the revenue potential of a European uh, wealth tax, a progressive European wealth tax. And um, our finding there was with such a tax, we, we might be able to raise about 3% of GDP in annual revenues. However, that still would only be about half of the green investment gap, which we estimated in, in our first paper. And so that gave rise to the third paper, the one I'm going to present here, which was to say, okay, if uh, we still need, uh, it is likely that we need um, debt funded public investment um, in order to tackle the challenges of climate, climate change, can that be done in a fiscally sustainable way? So these are the um, three, what the three big questions we uh, tackled, tried to shed some light on in, in this project. Um, all three of them are, are available uh, at, the, at the FEPS website and um, you, can, you can take a, a closer look. Now, the focus is on the last one, the third one, um, is a 10 trillion European climate investment uh, fiscally sustainable. Um, it is available online since um, yesterday. Uh, also the technical appendix is there. And at this point, um, let me use this opportunity to, to thank our project partners, the um, uh, Chamber of Labor in Vienna, the Rene Institute, and of course, um, FEPS. With, without them, uh, this project would not have been possible. And um, that, of course, is highly appreciated by us. And we um, are very thankful for that. And last but not least, it is joint work, as Maria has um, pointed out. Stuart Leach and Jakob Capella have, have worked um, along me on these, on these papers. So let's jump right in. And um, I will start with the, the scene or kind of the, the background, the motivation 
which uh, prompted us to to write that paper. And um, the starting point for us was to the observation that indeed climate change is a is a hot topic, <laughs> hot um, in the sense of there's um, a lot of attention. COP is on on our doorstep. One would think that. Uh, the political process is firmly focused on, on delivering the, the infrastructure and the policies we need in order to resolve the, the problems. As I've said, um, our findings, which are in some parts based on the European Commission's own research, is that the green investment gap, however, is, is huge. Um, so give you a bit of context here in the fit for um, 55 uh, pr proposals the commission now estimates updated its invest its its um, estimates of the um, investment gap green investment gap to be about 350 um, billion annually um that contrasts with um as i said this very interesting study from the commission from 2019 with the um, fact that probably in order to insulate the building stock in the European Union, about 500 billion annually um, are, are necessary to, to increase the renovation rates. On top of that, we estimate that um, in the electricity sector, industrial sector and R&D spending, probably another 315 uh, billion annually would be needed. Um, and that uh, doesn't even include the upgrades for the transport infrastructure. Um, uh, international high-speed trains as a, as a alternative to aviation, for example. So there seems to, it seems to be or our assessment is that the, the, the Commission's approach, and I think it's not only the a European problem, um, it, that their assessment is, is too optimistic of, of what needs to be done. Um, briefly, why is that the case? What is our um, take there or our explanation there? Um, I think a big part is the to what is the belief in in how effective to be believe are carbon markets um, and the 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 Commission's approach heavily relies on um, carbon markets price incentives to spur the private sector to close that investment gap and I think the there is a uh, uh, there are big questions about that um, uh, carbon markets of course offer an opportunity to um, offload the, the responsibility to someone else to buy certificates instead of act, acting now. We see with the current price spikes in, in gas, what is the reaction? It's not so much that um, urgent um, action in renewables is, is, um, is, is the response, of course, also because it is, it is not able to undo the um, missed opportunities from the past, but to talk about how to bring in a quickly cheap energy, cheap gas in order to, to alleviate the problem. So, um, and I think we will see more of that in the in the future if we simply rely on, on price mechanism. Um, also, a lot of the, the modeling the commission relies on is heavily relies on negative emissions going deeply into the 21st century, um, which effectively means uh, or allows us to be more comfortable now because we can fix the problem later. This is this is what negative emissions effectively are. Of course, to what extent that works is highly uncertain. Um, the IPCC reports, if you read them, um, the science is, is highly uncertain. Um, and it also is simply a huge gamble because if um, figuratively speaking, speaking, something happens to these trees you plant now and which need to be there for the next 60 years, the, the whole negative, your negative emissions on which you speculated there won't materialize. Um, and in addition to that, as we have seen also with the latest IPCC report, the, the situation is, is probably more serious than we thought. So this is kind of why we think the current assessment um, is, is too optimistic. Now, uh, based on that, um, the question is, okay, why don't we use uh, public procurement, so to say, but why don't we use governments to put the infrastructure we urgently need in, in place? And I think um, an, an important problem we're facing here is what I, will use for the, I will borrow the concept of media macro from, from Ren, Simon Ren Lewis, who is an economist in, in the UK here, um, which is the idea or the concept that um, 
journalists very much repeat uh, economic dogmas, uh, which often are very much removed from actual academic macroeconomic um, research. Uh, and this then becomes uh, very dominant in the in the public debate and shape, shapes the political process. Um, what do I mean with that? Uh, for example, media macro on fiscal policy, the dominant narrative is very much that fiscal policy is ineffective. It should be kept to a minimum. It's, it's rather a, a problem which we sometimes need, but we shouldn't rely too heavily on it. And even, even a better example is, is media macro on, on public debt, where uh, the dominant narrative is, is uh, public liabilities are a burden for our grandchildren. We need to repay them urgently and again should keep them for a minimum. Of course, there's a heap of uh, especially academic research after the financial crisis, which is very much in contrast with these dominant narratives. Um, fiscal policy um, is, is highly effective, especially in times of recessions and um, interest rates uh, restricted at the zero lower bound. And uh, lots of the presumable uh, reliable empirical research trying to establish thresholds or like the 60% uh, threshold for debt to GDP ratios turned out to be very, very shaky. And um, so in against that context, we thought, uh, okay, this is a very important question to be asked about um, what is really the long-term impact on public finances if governments went out and started to aggressively um, and at a large scale tr start to provide the inf infrastructure, the green infrastructure, which, which we need. That's kind of what we what motivated um, this, this study or, or what, we, what we're trying to, to achieve here. And uh, before going to the results, let me briefly talk a little bit about how we, how we do that. So first of all, when we get into the business of talking about fiscal sustainability, the million dollar question is, what does that mean? What is a fiscally sustainable uh, fiscal policy? And in the literature plus media, I would say three approaches pop up uh, regularly. The first is to focus on absolute numbers or debt figures per capita, so the um, total outstanding liabilities across the EU27 per, per capita are so, such and so many um, thousand euros. Uh, we, we did not go down this route because, of course, um, these are these are in a such not very meaningful, um, it's not a meaningful ap approach. It, it completely negates the income flow available to finance these debts and even more so the assets, so to say the other side of the balance sheet. It's akin to asking whether a company with liabilities of 100 million is heavily indebted or not. It's a, it's a meaningful question without the rest of the, of the balance sheet. Another approach, maximum at GDP levels. Um, these in general, we don't have a reliable basis for that. Um, the, the places where we have them, like in the Maastricht Treaty, they're, they're the outcome of a, effectively a political process and negotiation, but we don't have sound empirical or theoretical evidence to, to really pin down where that should be. And then, of course, we could use models in order to derive fiscal rules or, or targets. And um, the reason why we didn't go down that route is that it come then in order to judge whether that's a useful rule, you need to really understand and explain the underlying model. And then uh, we, we would be ending up today to talk about different macroeconomic models and to what extent we, we buy them or we think they are a good way of um, describing the economy. So we went down a, a different, a simpler route, which is to say, well, let's apply uh, a, a test, which is to say, if initial government investment spending leads to an economic expansion, which is larger than the additional debt which government has taken on, then we classify that kind of um, spending as uh, fiscally sustainable. We can think of it roughly as um, a decline or stable um, uh, level of, of debt to GDP ratios. So if uh, in response to additional spending, debt to GDP ratios would go down or remain stable, we would classify that as um, uh, sustainable fiscal policy. Now, let me say here that this is an extremely 
high bar, so to say. It's quite a conservative measure of, of what constitutes fiscal sustainable policies, because in many instances like climate change, the primary objective of that spending is not the economic expansion as such, but um, meeting other goals like um, providing clean energy. The reason why we still went for such a high bar is that if we manage to clear that hurdle, there is very much, uh, it's much more difficult to argue against or, or provide an argument why um, it, 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 is not, it is not done. Okay. Um, we, I think I will skip this part because um, I'm having a look at the time. I will point out, I, I, for, the, for the methodological part, I will point you to the appendix. Effectively, what we are doing is we're using a semi-structural vector autoregressive model, which you can, the explanation or the, the full details, um, I will point you to our online appendix and move on to our findings. And I will start with, uh, showing you the, the results for a permanent increase in government investment in across the EU27. And I'm focusing here on our model B, which is the larger model, which includes real GDP, real government investment, and real public uh, debt. And if we look at the dynamic response of that system to a permanent increase in uh, government investment, uh, here in the in the in the first picture, you see the investment impulse, which we scaled such that in the long run, after 12 years, we start to approach uh, a volume of um, 850 billion, which is the investment gap we found in our first study. The the um, key result we we find is that such a permanent expansion of investment spending leads to a substantial increase in uh, the size of the economy. Um, the long-term expansion in, in uh, GDP is about uh, 4,000 billion, 4 trillion, and the stock of government debt is um, slightly, slightly falling. So what that means is we start to see that uh, the main effect, the main um, result we have in our model is that we we have a massive expansion um, in 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 our in our model which we also see when we take a slightly different approach to the to this question of what is the effect of a um, permanent increase in government spending which is the uh, idea of looking at long run multipliers so with long run multipliers we effectively try to put these two parts of the system, the um, increased government expanding and the size of the economy into relation to each other um, to see by how much, uh, what is the, the relative response of the economy in response to the uh, initial increase in investment. And we can calculate these at different horizons. And what we get here is, um, very much compatible with what I've shown you on the on the previous side that especially after longer horizons after five or, or ten years our long run multipliers are in the region of five which really means that each additional euro of government investment spending will after five to ten years lead to um, five additional euros in um, GDP and of course with, with that we immediately see that we easily clear our hurdle of uh, our test for fiscal sustainable policy. Um, what we find is that uh, government investment has a, a strong expansionary effect, which substantially outweighs the initial cost, so to say. So we easily clear our, our hurdle, which we set ourselves. Um, yes. What we talked about so far was a permanent increase in government investment spending. Uh, of course, in the context of climate change, the potentially more interesting question is what happens if we, uh, we, we, we might not want to expand government investment for really a consistent or, or forever. We might only want to do it for five or 10 years in order to put the infrastructure in place, which we, uh, which we require. So what happens if we, um, try to answer the question of effect of a limited, let's say, five-year 
expansion in, in government investment spending. Um, we scaled it such that the response over the entire period after 12 years is um, in the 10 trillion region, which is, is consistent with the investment gap we have identified, identified in our first study. And of course, now you might ask, why is it that um, I say there is an investment impulse for the first five years, but then we'll talk about the entire period of 12 years. The, the issue with investment projects is that they take time. So even if we start to um, implement new projects for five years, there we will have a period beyond these five years where um, still governments um, spend more because they are still implementing the projects which have started up to that. Um, up to that point. Now, if we um, look at what the effect of such a policy is, here in yellow, we see our investment um, impulse for the first five years. So we start new projects up until um, five years and then kind of finish implementing uh, those gradually um, coming back to, to our baseline. Consistent with our multiplier of five, we have uh, um, a large increase in the size of the economy, which then also gradually declines as the investment impulse declines. And our budget balance um, is, is uh, initially positive, which means um, here we have in the beginning a uh, reduction in government liabilities and only towards the end, we will have um, deficit surpluses. Um, the Last point I want to make here is the difference between implementing such a strategy uh, as an initial, as an individual country or um, at the European level. So in the blue column, I show you the long run multipliers based on the EU27 data. We also compare that with uh, estimating that, that same model for all 27 member countries and then averaging the results. Of course, what that kind of gives you an idea for is what is the effect if um, countries happen, if countries act in, in isolation. And what we find is that these um, isolated multipliers or multipliers based on individual country um, estimations are substantially smaller. So we have uh, a strong case for acting in coordination for coordinated fiscal policy um, in order to or that will generate an even larger response, which makes sense since um, the uh, trade links are well established between European member states and there is less um, demand leakage from individual actions. Now, where does that leave us? Um, based on our results, the main policy conclusion is to um, go big, is to exploit those uh, large multipliers by um, using governments to provide the infrastructure we need to provide it if, um, quickly and at the required scale. Um, under investing or even cutting government investment is likely to leave public finances in a worse state. Um, so the message here is very stark um, and very clear. Also keep in mind that our our baseline, our test was quite um, strong. We had to generate expansions larger than the initial cost in order for us to classify um, these investment spendings as fiscally sustainable. Work together in the sense that um, isolated action by, by member states is likely to um, have smaller effects in terms of the economic expansion. So there is uh, there are gains to be made by um, coordinating fiscal policy at the European level. And uh, thirdly, which is not directly coming out of the model, but um, an, a logical implication is to update the fiscal rules. Um, the, the Maastricht criteria and the Stability and Growth Pact, um, what we see is effectively in many member states, they uh, lead and led in the past to um, sluggish or even uh, cutting of government investment spending. And um, based on, on the results we have, that um, is really costly, not only in terms of the lack of the infrastructure, which that uh, should provide, but also costly in terms of lost output and um, lost growth. Okay, that's it from my side. 
Thank you very much. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Raphael, for this um, excellent presentation and overview on uh, the policy paper. Um, so I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so we are switching to our panelists now. Um, as we also have a German speaking panelist, I would kindly invite all of the non German speaking audience to activate your uh, translation tool. You find the icon at the very right on the bottom of, um, of the Zoom tool. Um, yes, and I'm going to switch to German now. Ich möchte nämlich sehr herzlich uh, Joachim Schuster begrüßen. Um, Mitglied des Europäischen Parlaments uh, aus Deutschland. Uh, Joachim Schuster ist Sozialdemokrat. Er ist uh, Mitglied der S&D-Fraktion im Europäischen Parlament und auch Mitglied des ECON-Ausschusses, also dem Ausschusses für Wirtschaft und Währung. F herzlichen Dank fürs Dabeisein. Um, für Klimafinanzierung ist ja auch ein wichtiger Teil Ihrer Arbeit, war, ist auch quasi in, in letzter Zeit ein wichtiger Teil Ihrer Arbeit. Ich möchte Sie deshalb gern einladen, die Präsentation von Raphael Wilder auch zu kommentieren. Ja, vielen Dank für die Einladung. Die Präsentation kommentieren ist also vieles teilig und finde es also sehr wertvoll, dass das auch wirtschaftswissenschaftlich aufbereitet ist. Ich möchte aber drei Punkte trotzdem noch mal ganz kurz anstellen, weil ich glaube, wir haben in vielen Bereichen vor allen Dingen noch ideologische Probleme, dass also wir da nicht rein also kommen. Deswegen möchte ich noch mal betonen, dass Klimawandel ist die größte globale Herausforderung der Menschheit. Gelingt es nicht, den Temperaturanstieg so also rasch und konsequent zu begrenzen, werden die Überlebensmöglichkeiten für die Menschen in weiten Gebieten der Erde, eventuell sogar auf dem gesamten Globus, vernichtet. Dementsprechend also muss man immer daran gehen, dass Klimawandel die wirklich oberste Priorität haben muss, dieses zu bekämpfen und nicht eben meine, also wir hätten noch andere wichtigere Dinge, die wir nebenbei auch noch also richtig so, so, äh, verfolgen können, ohne den Klimawandel in den Mittelpunkt zu stellen. Das Gute ist dabei im Übrigen, man soll nämlich hier so aufhören, schwarz zu malen, finde ich. Äh, Im Grunde genommen wissen wir, wie wir dem begegnen können. Wir haben im wesentlichen Teil das Wissen und die Technologien, um so, äh, klimaneutral zu wirtschaften und zu leben. Das ist ein riesiger Vorteil, weil es ist vor allen Dingen jetzt nicht ein Problem also der Zielsetzung, es ist vor allen Dingen ein Problem der Umsetzung und daran kann man so also gut arbeiten. Zu den Investitionen, da wurde ja schon gesagt, dass wir massive öffentliche Investitionen brauchen. Ich will nur einen Aspekt dabei mit betonen, dass wir auch also massive öffentliche Unterstützung für private Investitionen brauchen. Es geht gar nicht nur darum, dass der Staat auf eigene Rechnung aktiv werden muss, sondern er muss auch privaten helfen, weil wir nicht erst warten können, bis wir die gesamte Marktwirtschaft völlig umgestaltet haben. Ich mache das nur kurz beispielhaft fest an einer energieintensiven Industrie wie der Stahlindustrie. Man weiß, welche Technologien man braucht, um die Produktionsprozesse klimaneutral zu machen. Das Problem ist nur, die kosten Pi mal Daumen doppelt so viel wie normale Investitionen. Und danach wird auch die Produktionskosten für klimaneutralen Stahl erstmal deutlich höher sein, als das also für, ich sage jetzt mal, CO2-belasteten Stahl ist. Das wird privatwirtschaftlich nur dann von den Unternehmen gestemmt werden, wenn sie entsprechende Unterstützung über Beihilfen kriegen. Und da geht es um mehrere Milliarden Euro, die auch also allein ein Bereich wie die Stahlindustrie braucht. Wir können das auf die Zementindustrie, auf die Aluminiumindustrie, auf die Chemieindustrie ausweiten. Es geht auch nicht privat ohne staatliche Unterstützung. Und das führt mich zu dem Teil, der auch viel also schon also angekündigt wird, äh, diskutiert wurde, beziehungsweise äh, betrachtet wurde. Äh, das ist nämlich die Frage, wie gehen wir eigentlich mit Schulden um? Also bisher haben wir es, also, äh, dass wir vor allen Dingen ideologisch mit der Frage öffentlicher Verschuldung umgehen und wir brauchen dringend einen Übergang zu einem rationalen Umgang mit öffentlichen Schulden. Und ich will da nur drei Sachen, also kurz benennen, woran es meines Erachtens hat und wo wir neben den wirtschaftswissenschaftlichen Erkenntnissen auch politisch dran arbeiten müssen. 
Das Erste ist schon die Frage, also äh, was einige Ökonomen und Politiker immer wieder von sich geben, dass ein bestimmter äh, Schuldenstand im Vergleich zum BIP an und für sich besonders problematisch sei. Wir haben in Europa die 60 Prozent. Wenn das so stimmen würde, dann müsste Japan schon lange pleite sein. Die haben nämlich einen deutlich höheren staatlichen Schuldstand. Und ich habe bisher noch nicht vernommen, also dass irgendjemand auf der Welt besonders Angst hat, dass Japan in den nächsten ein bis zwei oder fünf Jahren pleite gehen würde. Natürlich hat es bestimmte ökonomische Folgen, aber es ist nicht ein Horrorgemälde, was man dort malen muss. Das Zweite aus meiner Sicht ist, das wurde gerade auch schon dargestellt, aber was auch eben bisher in der Politik und in der öffentlichen Debatte häufig ideologisch geprägt und irrational ist, ist im Prinzip die vereinfachste Aussage, öffentliche Schulden sind per se schlecht und müssten eigentlich vermieden werden. Deswegen haben wir dann auch möglichst harte Schuldenbremsen, weil das also andersweitig also in den finanzpolitischen und ökonomischen Chaos führen würde. Und ich glaube, dem muss man entgegentreten, denn öffentliche Schulden sind genauso wie private Schulden per se weder gut noch schlecht. Die entscheidende Frage ist, also, was wird mit den also, Schulden finanziert? Welchen Zweck haben die also, Investitionen? Werden damit dauerhafte Werte geschaffen, die auch also, Ressourcen generieren, um den Schuldendienst zu finanzieren? Und eine wichtige Frage, auch die muss man also dazu nochmal machen. Das Ganze wird, hängt auch maßgeblich davon ab, wie nachhaltig das ist, inwieweit wir es schaffen, das Zinsniveau entsprechend zu beeinflussen. Ich will damit nicht der absoluten Niedrigzinspolitik das Wort reden, weil die auch also Nachteile hat, aber ein vernünftiges Zinsniveau kann man auch also staatlich beeinflussen zumindest. Und wenn man diese Bedingungen alle äh, umfasst, dann ist es auch möglich, so etwas zu finanzieren. Und im dritten Unsinn, den wir uns, glaube ich, entgegenstellen äh, müssen, ist das also mit der sogenannten Generationengerechtigkeit, weil wir halt durch Schulden angeblich der zukünftigen Generation äh, nur also, äh, die Armut hinterlassen. Äh, ich glaube, die zukünftigen Generationen würden uns eher bestrafen, wenn wir bestimmte Investitionen im Klimaschutz jetzt nicht tätigen, weil die haben das also in wenigen Jahren auszubaden, was wir heute versäumen. Und wir sehen das ja schon an den Stark Starkwetterereignissen oder Extremwetterereignissen, die wir im Moment haben. Das Ganze kostet bei weitem mehr, also allein die Schäden dann zu beheben, statt jetzt zu investieren, damit man also die Schäden versucht zu minimieren oder sogar ganz zu verhindern. Aber auch das ist also eine dritte also ideologische Diskussion, die wir, glaube ich, also führen müssen. Und ich denke, und das ist das Letzte, wenn wir das gemeinsam, also wissenschaftlich untermauert, aber eben auch dann also politisch offensiv also geführt, die Debatte, dass wir gute Chancen haben, das also auch für die Zukunft, also die richtigen Weichen zu stellen, weil uns bleibt in der Tat sehr wenig Zeit. Vielen Dank. Ähm, ja. Herzlichen Dank auch für, glaube ich, die wichtige Anmerkung, dass eine wichtige Frage im Bereich der Klimafinanzierung auch ist, wie flexibel ist man überhaupt politisch in der Entscheidung, welche Investitionen werden privat und welche öffentlich getätigt. Um, I'd like to include Naim Kordemans in the debate. I hope I'm not completely wrong in pronouncing it. Your, your name, who is an advisor to the Belgian State Secretary for Recovery and Strategic Investments to Martin Min. I would like also to invite you to comment on Raphael's presentation and uh, I'd maybe like to uh, add uh, a question uh, as you are familiar with investment policies. Do you think um, or to, to what great um, are um, investments even manageable in this large scale by federal and regional governments or the EU as a whole? Because Rafael already um, pointed out the time scale that is quite uh, ambitious, um, I would say. Um, what's your thought on that? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to take part in the, this planning and congratulations to the to the author of the, the paper and uh, for the presentation, which is excellent. 
Um, maybe just to, to summarize a bit my, my view on, uh, on this, uh, I, I totally agree with the, the big message that we should go big um, and that the EU is unfit for 50 feet uh, at the moment um, and including the, the measures that, uh, that are presented uh, by the EU Commission uh, will not make it fit for, uh, for uh, um, 2030. Um, we have to go big and we have to go together. Um, I think in the context of the pandemic, um, EU leaders have shown that they can decide, uh, they can break some taboo um, when the urgency is there. And obviously the, the urgency of the climate is not as visible as the one of the pandemic, but it is, it is there, it should be taken as a, um, I'm sorry. It's it's a it's a key um, it's a clear urgency um, um, and I'm sorry um, the the so the the RRF and the, the next generation EU as um, is a precedent so, um, at least in terms of investment that the EU can go together it it should go um, I think much bigger and much um, larger uh, now when it comes to fighting climate change and fighting the destruction of the environment um, by not only uh, subsidizing or lending money to the country for them to implement some infrastructure project, but also to develop project at the EU level, certainly in term uh, when it comes to energy in uh, transport, um, there are many a very small country in the EU and um, they, they should uh, absolutely work together to make it uh, as efficient as possible, uh, not only financially, but also to, to fight uh, the climate change and uh, to preserve the environment. So um, it was mentioned that the, the, the fiscal coordination is key, but uh, also in terms of developing uh, relevant project, uh, I think there is a, a real, importance to, uh, to coordinate uh, and to lead uh, possibly policy at the EU level. Um, when it comes to the financial sustainability, uh, I very much agree that, it, it, that there is, it's not an issue. Uh, first, it should not be an issue because um, we should compare fighting climate change like a war with the objective of realizing the transition um, this is this should be uh, elevated to to our mission society for, to, to the mission of our society and we should put all the resource uh, to achieve this transition um the debt is is really uh, and i'm not saying it's anecdotic it's something to take into account but the objective is to lead this transition um and uh, beside that there are plenty of factors that show that the the debt um, level would be uh, perfectly sustainable, even with a massive uh, investment. Uh, we can cite a, a few factors. Um, yeah, after wars, uh, countries like France or the UK had debt to GDP over 200%. At the moment, Japan has a, has a debt level of uh, 266%. Um, there are plenty of uh, possible tax uh, that could help finance this, uh, this transition. Uh, and as the study showed uh, uh, the multiplier uh, behind all this uh, public investment is uh, extremely important. Um, so the, um, the, the, the big issue is, is more um, politically and materially um, how to, to, to decide and how to make this transition. It's not really financial. Um, and as was mentioned also by Mr. Schuster, uh, the debt is, is, is a bad word for many people, but the, the, the bad debt is, the, is when the money is badly used, but when it's used for the transition, which is used for the, um, the biggest challenge of our society, this is a very good debt. And uh, there is no, um, we should very much distinguish the way the debt is used. Um, just to, to finish on this, I, I like very much the, a sentence of uh, Barry Eichen Green uh, from the, the University of Berkeley, where he compared uh, the fact that government would not uh, borrow to fight climate change and to, to preserve the environment with the parents that would not borrow um, money to, to offer to their child 
uh, vital surgery. Um, would you, as a parent, refuse to borrow to, to offer this vital surgery? Um, probably not. So in, in the context of the, the transition, you should also uh, do what you need to, to fight climate change and, uh, and preserve the environment. Now to, to answer to your question, um, obviously investment project, quality investment project uh, take time. Um, what I saw uh, in the context of building the, the national uh, recovery and resilience plans of Belgium is that um, when you have to go fast, you open the drawer and you look at the project which were not financed before. Um, and this might not be the best one. There is a reason why they were not financed before. Um, so yes, that's, that's indeed a, a big issue is how to make sure that the um, investment infrastructure project are the best one. Um, so they should, they should be thought about right now, or they should have already been thought way before, but uh, we should start uh, as fast as possible um, to think about the best project. Um, and uh, that's a, certainly a big challenge is uh, how to make this transition in the most efficient way um, and, and yeah, efficient in terms of its objective against climate change and obviously efficient in terms of uh, using public money. Um, yeah, maybe we'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naeem. Um, I'd like to also pass over this question to back to Raphael because we also have um, this question from um, uh, Janos in the F and A in the Q and A uh, window, who says thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, 10 trillion in green investment sounds exciting, but they need to be invested in worthwhile projects. Are there enough of these projects? Did you come across enough of worthwhile projects during your research? Yes, I mean, this is, this is of course, um, an important question. Uh, I think the the answer is, of course, we have enough um, worthwhile projects uh, because the the scale of the problem is is there. Um, do we have enough uh, projects which are ready to start? Probably not. Um, uh, and, and this is, uh, as also Naim has, has pointed out, it's kind of the shortcoming of the last um, five or ten years that we didn't already um, think and, and start develop uh, these 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 projects. What that means is, of course, in the in the short term, we we might very much struggle to to indeed implement that. I, I think that uh, is 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 a is a realistic assessment, um, but it also shows that um, we need to we need to start um, very soon and and um, really the size of such an investment initiative should be primarily guided by what we need. As as um, also Joachim said, the 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 fighting climate change is the utmost uh, priority. Um, we cannot make this into a discussion about um, uh, the, the, the how, to, how to finance that. Now, um, the, the so yes, so in that sense, I, 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 we, the, the projects are, are certainly there. Um, the, with respect to, to the importance of, we had we had the war analogy that um, we, we need to look at that as as fighting a war and we don't ask about um, whether we can repay the debt uh, in in a war. I mean, um, whether the war analogy is, is so good or or uh, I'm a bit uncomfortable with, with that analogy with, with the fundamental with the fundamental um, statement. I I would agree. I think what what we tried to do with this study is to. Uh, add another argument or another punch, so to say, um, in this conversation, such that even if we uh, are still asked for that follow-up question, um, the data shows us that uh, there is really not much to be worried in terms of the long-term sustainability of uh, large-scale investment spending. So um, we, we do not want to, uh, or I, I, we are not looking at this study from a perspective of okay now that we know um, it's it's fiscally sustainable or, or, or this is 
what we need to look at first before we seriously think about that. I think it's just an, an additional ar argument to, to be able to make a strong case that it uh, doesn't make sense from an um, environmental policy perspective, but also it doesn't even make sense from an economic policy perspective to um, not act uh, large uh, decisively and, and, and act now. So this, this kind of um, thing is the main takeaway uh, for, from, from, from our findings. Thank you very much. I'd uh, once more like to come back to uh, Joachim Schuster. Um, es gibt mehrere Fragen, uh, die sich mit dem Thema des um, von Preisanreizen, also die sich mit dem Thema von preislichen oder also ja. Anreizen beschäftigen. Und, äh, Raphael Wildau hat ja auch in seiner Präsentation kritisch den CO2-Handel äh, angesprochen und es gibt zwei Fragen, ähm, eine von Uwe Wissenbach und eine von Georgi Pirinski. Ähm, Georgi Pirinski fragt, ob äh, vielleicht ähm, quasi die ähm, Vielleicht, ob es vielleicht gar nicht mehr so sehr brennt, die Sache mit dem Klimawandel, wenn man sieht, dass Energiepreise ohnehin stark in die Höhe steigen in letzter Zeit und es Angebotsschwierigkeiten gibt. Und Uwe Wissenbach fragt quasi ein bisschen von der anderen Seite, wie kann denn überhaupt Klimapolitik wirksam sein, wenn Menschen, wenn private Haushalte auch ähm, äh, quasi gefordert werden, für einen großen Teil ihrer Einkommen in äh, klimafreundliche Ausgaben ähm, zu investieren, zum Beispiel sich ein E-Auto anzuschaffen oder ein, eine neue Heizung für ihr Haus. Und dann wollte ich noch eine Abschlussfrage gleich noch dazu packen, weil unsere Zeit schon fast zu Ende ist. Ähm, wie ähm, entwickelt sich denn überhaupt äh, auch auf äh, EU-Ebene die Diskussion über die Fiskalregeln, die uns ja seit spätestens seit der Finanzkrise und der Eurokrise ähm, massiv begleiten, auch in Deutschland äh, im Rahmen der Koalitionsverhandlungen natürlich ein Thema sind, ähm, weil man hat schon den Eindruck, dass sich da etwas bewegt und dass sich auch die politische, der politische Fokus da entwickelt. Wie äh, nehmen Sie da das auch als, ähm, als äh, der Mitglied des Europäischen Parlaments wahr? Ja, ich versuche es dann also kurz zu machen, weil die Zeit ja so begrenzt ist. Zu den Preis, äh, Anreizen über Preise. Ich finde das sehr wichtig und zwar in allen den Bereichen, äh, wo es dadurch möglich wird, dass diejenigen, die die Mehrkosten zu bezahlen haben, auch die Entscheidungshoheit haben, äh, dagegen was zu tun und die realen Möglichkeiten auch was zu tun. Äh, das ist in vielen Bereichen im Bereich der also Industrie also der Fall, dass das also äh, ein sehr wichtiges Mittel ist. Grenzen erhält, hat so ein Mittel, wenn es also dann Menschen trifft, die da selbst gar keine Entscheidungshoheit haben, etwas preiswerter zu machen. Deswegen bin ich auch beispielsweise sehr skeptisch, den Emissionshandel auf den Gebäudebereich auszuweiten, weil die wenigsten Mieter entscheiden darüber, was für eine Heizung unten im Keller steht. Und dementsprechend also haben sie auch nicht wirklich die Möglichkeit, gegenzusteuern. Und sie können auch das Haus nicht dämmen. Und deswegen ist das da äußerst problematisch, wenn das also da machen. Der extrem starke Preisanstieg hat natürlich auch, bietet die Gefahr so großer Widerstände, die dann eher also in die kontraproduktive Richtung gehen. Wir haben das gesehen bei der Geldbestenbewegung in Frankreich, dass es keineswegs Preis, also selbst wenn es moderate Preissteigerungen sind, dass die einen positiven Effekt haben und nicht erst mal richtig Widerstände erzeugen. Allerdings für die Industrie halte ich das also eine sehr wichtige Sache, weil also natürlich auch, ich hatte das angesprochen bei der Frage von Beihilfen, äh, operative Kosten also, äh, dann leichter in den Griff zu kriegen sind oder wenn also, äh, klimaneutrale Produktionsverfahren äh, operativ teurer sind. Das hängt natürlich davon ab, was für einen CO2-Preis ich auf der anderen Seite zu bezahlen habe. Und deswegen ist es sehr wichtig, einen Preismechanismus auch in den Bereichen zu haben. Wie entwickelt sich die Diskussion in Deutschland? Äh, Im Moment also ist also in Bezug auf die Europäische Union festgehalten, also dass der Stabilitäts- und, Wachstumspakt, äh, und ja, Wachstumspakt die Grundlage bilden soll. Äh, das ist erstmal eine ganz logische Aussage, weil das ist Vertragswerk der EU, was wir nicht also 
schon gar nicht von Deutschland aus alleine verändern. Wir können darauf aufbauen, so also sollen Lösungen gefunden werden, wie man also entsprechend also die Zukunft nachhaltig gestaltet. Das bietet viele also Möglichkeiten. In Deutschland haben wir dann selbst die Diskussion, dass gesagt wird, eigentlich für Deutschland wollen wir die Schuldenbremsen einhalten. Das ist ein Punkt gewesen, den vor allen Dingen die FDP immer wieder betont. Gleichzeitig wird anerkannt, dass wir gigantisch mehr Investitionen haben. Und es kommt natürlich die Frage auf, inwieweit man das finanzieren kann. Wobei man für Deutschland wissen muss, ist die Schuldenbremse in einem Punkt löchrig. Öffentliche Unternehmen können durchaus für relevante also Bereiche oder relevante Investitionen Schulden aufnehmen. Deswegen denkt man darüber nach an Wohnungsbaugesellschaften, die das machen sollen, an die Deutsche Bahn, die also natürlich investieren soll in Klimaschutzsachen. Also im Moment haben wir auch da zumindest noch keine offene Diskussion darüber, was ist eigentlich hundertprozentig notwendig. Aber alle politischen Akteure, also insbesondere die Liberalen, die da besonders überzeugt werden müssen, sehen auch, also, dass wir offensichtlich das Problem haben, Investitionen, massiv Investitionen zu steigern und das irgendwie auch bezahlt werden muss. Und man im Moment eher über Haushalte nachdenkt, die nicht direkt in den Bundeshaushalt reingerechnet werden oder in die Länderhaushalte. Ist noch nicht hinreichend, aber es ist Bewegung aus meiner Sicht, also, die man nutzen muss und verstärken muss. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, our time is up. Uh, I would have loved to continue the debate. Thank you, uh, Raphael Wilder, for your excellent presentation and to Joachim Schuster and Naim Grademont for commenting and for giving us insight in your professional experience on the topic. This is it from this panel. We are moving on to the next one. Greetings from Vienna. <laughs>